Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about metabolism. So metabolism is the sum total of all the chemical reactions that take place within a cell or a living organism. What we're going to talk about today specifically are the different types of chemical reactions that occur in living systems, as well as the role that enzymes play in making these reactions possible and how those enzymes are regulated in order to make sure that those chemical reactions only take place when and how they're supposed to. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about metabolism. As I mentioned in the intro, metabolism is the sum total of all chemical reactions that take place within a biological system. And what we're going to be talking about today are the specific types of chemical reactions that take place in biological systems, as well as how those chemical reactions are regulated by proteins called enzymes, and how those enzymes themselves are regulated to ensure that only the right reactions take place at the right time within a biological system. So before we start talking about chemical reactions, let's talk about thermodynamics real quick. Thermodynamics is a physical science that examines the interrelationship between different types of energy. And there are two laws of thermodynamics that we need to be aware of if we're gonna understand how metabolism works. The first law of thermodynamics states that the energy of the universe is constant. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but can be transformed. The second law of thermodynamics states that all chemical reactions must increase the entropy of the universe. Now, entropy is kind of a weird word. Entropy is a term that refers to randomness or chaos. So what that means, actually, according to the second law of thermodynamics, is that the universe trends towards chaos. It trends towards randomness. And that to go against that, and I guess the opposite of entropy would be order, goes actually against the trend of the universe. Now, that's particularly important with respect to biological systems, because if you remember, one of the seven key properties of all living things is order. So how do living things seek to maintain order, or how are they able to maintain order? And the answer is simple. It requires the input of energy. All living things require a steady input of energy in order to maintain highly ordered systems that all living things require. What's interesting is a while back, the second law of thermodynamics was actually thrown in the face of evolutionary biology with the claim that life could never have arisen as it has without the intervening of some sort of celestial being because it goes against the second law of thermodynamics. But unfortunately, that argument doesn't hold weight. The reason why has to do with a big glowing yellow ball in the sky, the sun. All of the Earth is bathed in energy from the sun, and because we have groups of organisms on the planet called phototrophs that can turn that light energy into actual usable energy, we acquire 99.9% .9 of all of the energy on this planet is powered directly or indirectly by the sun, and it's the input of the energy from the sun that actually allows biological systems to maintain high levels of order. What that also means is that all organisms from the, the most simple single-celled organism to the most complex multicellular organism are really nothing more than energy transformation machines. That type of energy transformation and the chemical reactions that make this possible is what we're talking about when we are referring to metabolism. So if biological systems are nothing more than energy transformation vessels, what types of energy are there? Well, one example of a type of energy is kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is the type of energy that's associated with motion. When we look at temperature, temperature is nothing more than a measurement of the average kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules within a particular substance. Another type of energy is called potential energy. Potential energy is a type of energy associated with the position or the structure of a particular substance. So if we look at gravitational potential energy as an example, uh, look at a waterfall. When you look at a waterfall, you have water at the top of the falls and water at the bottom. The water at the top of the falls has more gravitational potential energy than the water at the bottom. How is that energy transformed? Well, when the water falls over the falls, some of it gets lost in the form of heat. Some of it's going to be lost in the form of the kinetic energy, the energy of it moving. And some of it is going to be lost in the form of sound energy. That's why waterfalls are loud. 
We can also look at a different type of potential energy called chemical energy. Uh, so chemical energy is the type of energy that's stored within the chemical bonds of a particular molecule or a particular substance. So for example, if we look at a molecule like glycogen with lots of different glucose monomers all attached to each other through covalent bonds, there is lots of chemical energy within that molecule. And the way to release that chemical energy is to break those bonds. And that's largely what we will be doing in biological systems. We will be harvesting the energy contained within food molecules, breaking those bonds and using, that ener using those, the energy that's contained to do cellular work. Another type of way of, of using uh, of chemical energy is to store it in the form of chemical energy. So for example, if we look at those phototrophs, those plants and algae and other organisms that derive their energy from the sun, they are actually able to trap solar energy in the form of photons of light and transform that and store that in the form of chemical bonds for later use or for use as a food source for other organisms. So how do living systems transform energy from one type to the next? Well, in order to do this, they're going to have to perform chemical reactions. Now, before we talk about chemical reactions, we need to talk about one more type of energy. And that type of energy is called Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is abbreviated with the symbol delta G, so a little triangle with the letter, capital letter G next to it. And Gibbs free energy is the amount of energy that occurs within a chemical reaction. So what you'll see is that some chemical reactions have a negative delta G. That means in that particular chemical reaction, that chemical reaction is going to be releasing energy. So over time, there's less energy in the reaction than you started with. On the other hand, chem certain chemical reactions have a positive delta G. This is a chemical reaction that is going to be absorbing energy. As a reaction proceeds, more energy goes into it. Now, how do we describe those chemically? Well, the first type of reaction, the type of reaction with a negative delta G, or a type of chemical reaction that is going to release energy, is what we call an exergonic reaction. Now, you may, you can kind of relate these to uh, probably something you're more familiar with. You may have heard of exothermic reactions. Exothermic reactions are chemical reactions that release heat. But in a biological system, we don't want to always be dealing with heat, especially in an organism like a human being, uh, where we want heat to stay, our temperature to stay relatively similar. Instead, we're going to be using the suffix gonic, which refers to energy. So an exergonic reaction is a chemical reaction that is going to release energy. So if we look at a Gibbs free energy diagram for an exergonic reaction, you can see on one side we have the reactants. Those are the things that we start with. On the other side, we have the products. And as the reaction proceeds, you can see that the reactants have more free energy than the products do. But let's go back real quick to our first law of thermodynamics. Where did that energy go? Well, if we were talking about an exothermic reaction, that energy would be lost almost exclusively to heat. But in a biological system, we don't want to lose the majority of that energy to heat. We are going to lose some of that energy to heat, and some of that energy is going to go to increase the entropy of the universe. So that's the second law of thermodynamics. But we're, we're going to capture a significant portion of that released energy to do some type of usable cellular work. The converse to this, then, is the endergonic reaction. An endergonic reaction is a chemical reaction with a positive delta G. It is a chemical reaction that absorbs energy. So what this means is this is a particular type of reaction that is what we would call non-spontaneous. It's not really going to occur on its own. It's going to require the input of a significant amount of energy to keep that reaction moving along. But where does that energy come from? Well, it depends. If you are a phototroph, many of your chemical reactions are going to be powered by photons of light. So the energy is going to come from solar energy. But if you're a chemoheterotroph like you and I are, well, the bulk of that energy is going to come from a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That is the energy currency of life. Um, and it turns out that by based on its particular chemical structure, ATP is a high energy molecule. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But by, by coupling the energy from hydrolyzing that ATP, breaking those chemical bonds, we can use that to power endergonic reactions within the cell. And sometimes we, we couple that directly, sometimes it's indirect. So if you remember our conversation about transport, for example, we have primary active transport. Those are uh, transporters that directly use ATP. And then we had secondary active transport that uses an electrochemical gradient. In biological systems, the same can be said for other chemical reactions as well. 
direct or indirect use of ATP can be used to power endergonic reactions. Now, as I mentioned before, metabolism is the sum total of all chemical reactions that occur within the cell. And there are two different sides to any metabolism. There is what we call anabolism and what we call catabolism. So anabolism is the aspect of metabolism that is building things. So typically we are constructing large molecules from smaller, simpler ones. In general, our anabolic reactions are going to be endergonic. They're going to require the absorption of energy. So you can think about ATP as an example. When we phosphorylate ADP by adding another phosphate group to making ATP, that is going to consume energy. We are adding an additional chemical bond. That chemical bond is going to store the majority of the energy that we put into making that happen. So we call phosphorylation. As opposed to that, we have the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP and a phosphate. That is going to be an exergonic reaction. That is catabolism. We are breaking things down to release energy. So anabolism is building. Catabolism is breaking down. And in most biological systems, you have to have a combination of both. For example, in chemoheterotrophs like you and I, we do catabolism largely to power our anabolism. And what are we trying to build through our anabolism? Well, we're trying to build the biomolecules that we need to survive. Our lipids, our carbohydrates, our proteins, for example. But we also need to build up a significant amount of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And the reason why is ATP, as I said before, is the energy currency of life. Adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, has a significant amount of chemical energy stored within it. In particular, it has three phosphoanhydride bonds. So it's the, 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 the adenosine molecule attached to three different phosphates. There is a significant amount of chemical energy stored between, within the chemical bond between the second and third phosphates, as well as the first and second phosphate, but predominantly between the second and third phosphates. And the hydrolysis of that bond, the breaking of that bond, releases a significant amount of energy. And that energy in biological systems is utilized by proteins like transporters and enzymes to perform cellular work. This is what we call energy coupling. Now there are other types of, of energy containing molecules found within cells. Uh, another good example is GTP, so guanine triphosphate. Uh, some enzymes, some receptors use GTP as an energy source, but it's predominantly ATP that is going to be providing the energy for most of the metabolic reactions we're talking about. And this is because the enzymes that are performing these endergonic reactions are going to require ATP as an energy source. So we're gonna talk in just a minute about enzymes, which are protein catalysts. But before we do that, we need to look at our Gibbs free energy diagrams, again, involving both exergonic and endergonic reactions. And the reason why is I want you to notice something. Look at both of these types of chemical reactions. What you notice is that whether it's exergonic and releases energy or endergonic and consumes energy, notice that there's this little tiny hump right before you transition from the reactants into the products. What you should notice then is that all chemical reactions actually require a little bit of energy to get going. This energy is what we call activation energy. In all chemical reactions, whether they're exergonic and spontaneous or endergonic and non-spontaneous, require activation energy. The reason why is this. If you are looking at a stable molecule, if you were looking at a molecule or a salt or whatever you're looking at, those atoms within that molecule or salt are happy. They are in a stable conformation. And if you want them to change into something else, even if it's highly energetically favorable, you have to provide them with a little bit of energy to put them into a high energy transition state. And that is what the activation energy is. And overcoming that activation energy barrier is necessary for making all chemical reactions to occur. In fact, it's what prevents most chemical reactions from just taking place all the time within a cell. So activation energy is actually a very good thing. And the reason why activation energy is a good thing is because if there was no requirement to put in even a little bit of energy to kickstart a reaction, all of the chemical reactions within your cell would take place all the time. And we don't want that to happen. The inside of your cells would be chaos. In fact, if that actually occurred within biological systems, biological things would never exist. Life could never exist because we need the chemical reactions within our highly ordered cells to occur in a highly ordered manner. And it's enzymes that make this happen. So let me use a bit of an analogy to explain how enzymes help. Let's picture activation energy 
um, in a different context. Let's picture you laying on your couch watching television. You're laying on your couch and you're watching television. So you're sitting there and all of a sudden, whatever show you end watching ends, and now you're looking at an infomercial. And you don't wanna watch this infomercial. You desperately want to change the channel and watch something different. But here's the problem. The remote is sitting on the kitchen counter. You left it there when you went to get a snack during a commercial break of your previous show. Now you're laying down. And as much as you want to change the channel, you also don't want to get up. If there was a way to get up, then you would happily walk into the kitchen, grab the remote, change the channel, probably grab another snack, and be happy with your life. In other words, you'd spontaneously do those things. It's energetically favorable for you to do those things if you could just stand up. Standing up is the activation energy. It's that activation energy hump that you need to kickstart the reaction, even a favorable reaction like going to get the remote or like an exergonic reaction that's going to release energy. An enzyme is something that helps a molecule get into that transition state. So what if we were to fashion a, a little tiny device that would just flip you off of the couch or stand you up on its own? Maybe some type of harness that would grab you and stand you on your feet if you just hit a button. That'd be great, right? You'd be much more likely to stand up because you just get up. Now you're standing up. You go get your remote and do other things that you want to do. That is what enzymes do. Enzymes are proteins that function to lower that activation energy barrier. They cannot eliminate it. They simply reduce it through several different mechanisms. We'll talk about those in just a second. But first, let's talk about what enzymes are. So enzymes are protein catalysts. And just like any catalyst, catalysts work to, in, to speed up the rate of a chemical reaction, often several hundred thousand times faster than it would normally be. The other big thing about enzymes is they can neither be consumed nor altered by the reaction. They don't actually get changed by the reaction that they're participating in. They simply facilitate the conversion. Uh, they facilitate a chemical reaction, the conversion of the reactant into the products. Okay. So because enzymes are proteins, they have that three-dimensional fold that all proteins have. They have to fold into their proper structure. And because they are proteins, just like any other protein, they're exquisitely sensitive to things like pH and temperature. In fact, one of the reasons why chemical insults and thermal insults can damage cells or kill them is because they can cause the enzymes within that cell or cells to denature, killing the organism. The three-dimensional structure of enzymes, just like all proteins, is extremely important to its activity as well. So all enzymes are gonna have something called an active site. And an active site is where the chemical reaction is actually going to take place. Enzymes, on the whole, are massive compared to the actual substrates, which are the reactants, that they operate on. So they act as sort of a home to facilitate a chemical reaction to make it happen in a, in, in a, a, in a faster manner. So when we talk about the reactants that enter into an enzyme to perform an enzymatic chemical reaction, those are what we refer to as substrates. And then what leaves are the products of that enzymatic reaction. The reason why the three-dimensional structure of an enzyme is so important is because that active site that each enzyme has has to be able to specifically interact with the required substrates for that enzymatic reaction and only those substrates. Enzymes are exquisitely sensitive to the types of substrates on which they work. Let me give you an example. I'm sure all of you have heard of trans fats and trans fats are not good for you. One of the reasons why trans fats aren't good for you is because your body simply can't process them. Trans fats are artificially produced fats, and they're referred to as trans fats because the orientation of the molecule is actually different than fats which occur in nature. Natural fats are referred to as cis fats. And you can see just the subtle difference between the way these chemicals are bound uh, or on, along the double bond in this particular diagram. But the end result of this reverse binding in trans fats is to contort the molecule into a different conformation. And even though chemically they're identical to each other, structurally they are not. They are isomers of each other. There's a cis isomer and a trans isomer. What's interesting is the enzymes that help to break down these fatty acids. The enzymes are so exquisitely sensitive that they will work to catabolize cis fats, but they cannot work to catabolize trans fats. And as a result, trans fats just simply can't be broken down and can actually accumulate in your body because there's no metabolic way of removing them from your system. So how do enzymes do what they do? Well, 
Like I said before, all enzymes function to reduce the activation energy of a chemical reaction. They don't eliminate it, they don't completely erase it altogether, but they work to lower that activation energy hump, which means they can make reactions happen incredibly fast. How fast? Well, some of the fastest working enzymes on the planet Earth can perform 100,000 or over 100,000 different chemical reactions per second. That's right, they can perform the same chemical reaction on different substrates 100,000 times per second. It's faster than you can actually comprehend for the most part as a human being. That's how fast they make chemical reactions occur. And if they didn't exist, and if they didn't perform reactions this quickly, most of the chemical reactions that take place in your body would not occur at a rate compatible with the speed of life. They just simply wouldn't happen fast enough for life to exist. So by what mechanisms do enzymes actually lower that activation energy hump? Well, there's four. The first one is what we call microenvironment. Remember that enzymes are significantly bigger than the substrates upon which they work. So some things just don't want to react because they don't like being in the particular environment they're in. So let's picture two hydrophobic substances. Are they going to be content to react and behave normally in the aqueous cytoplasm? No, I don't think so. So what do they do? Well, they get inside of, a, uh, of the active site of a particular enzyme. That enzyme probably has a hydrophobic core where those enzymes can relax, or I'm sorry, those substrates can relax and be a little bit happier being in the hydrophobic environment. They're more likely to play nice together. The reaction happens much faster, and then they release the products out into uh, the cytoplasm once the reaction is complete. So that's what microenvironment does. The next one is orientation. Molecules can't just slam into each other randomly and have the reaction take place, no the right part of the molecules have to line up to occur. Think about, for example, a dehydration synthesis reaction. If you're going to join those two molecules, you have to have those functional groups lined up appropriately. So that's what those enzymes largely do. They grab onto both of those substrates, line them up appropriately, and in doing so, make sure that that reaction happens significantly faster than it otherwise would, allowing them to randomly collide with each other in the cytoplasm. Another type of mechanism is called direct participation. So direct participation is a, is a little bit strange. With direct participation, what you're gonna see is that the enzyme is going to become temporarily modified. I know what I said before, enzymes cannot be permanently modified. They can't be, but they can be temporarily modified. So what happens in this case is the enzyme quite often removes one of the, one of the parts of the molecule that's reacting. So they'll, for example, take a functional group off of this particular compound hold on to it for a second, take a functional group off of the other substrate, hold on to that one for a second, and then switch them. So that the functional group from, from compound A is now on B, and the functional group from compound B is now on the end of compound A. Now, in the end, is the enzyme at all altered? No, but it's temporarily altered. We call it direct participation because the enzyme literally participates in being temporarily modified by that particular reaction. But in the end, that enzyme is not consumed, nor is it permanently altered. The last type of, of mechanism is called stretching or straining of chemical bonds. If you want to break a chemical bond, one of the easiest ways to do it is just simply make the atoms that are attached to each other farther apart. Remember, when we're dealing with chemical bonds, largely what we're dealing with is the attraction of electrons to the nuclei within that particular compound. Well, if you quite simply move those electrons too far away, from the positively charged nucleus of that neighbor of the atom it's attached to, then it's no longer going to be bound. So when you look at something that uh, an enzyme that performs like this stretching or straining interaction, quite simply what they're doing is bending or contorting or stretching a molecule so that that you, it's basically pulled apart, uh, so that those so those chemical bonds can no longer exist. One way to remember it is MODS, M-O-D-S, Microenvironment Orientation, Direct Participation, and Stretching and Straining of Bonds. Those are the four mechanisms by which enzymes can operate to reduce the activation energy required for a chemical reaction to take place. And by reducing the activation energy, they speed up or enhance the rate of the chemical reactions that occur. So enzymes are hugely important for all biological systems. Without them, we would, not have the, we would not have reactions occurring at the rate compatible with life, but the other huge thing they do is they work specifically on their own substrates, which means they can't facilitate all chemical reactions. They can only facilitate the chemical reactions that they're able to participate in. They can only work with a, direct, a certain set of substrates. This is very important because as I said at the beginning of this, you do not want a scenario in a highly ordered living system of all of these chemical reactions just occurring 
willy-nilly, however they want, whenever they want. So the big thing that cells have to do to ensure that only the right chemical reactions are taking place at the right time is to regulate enzymes. They need to make sure then that because they can't dictate what particular chemicals are found in a cell, what they can dictate though is which of those chemicals are able to interact with which other chemicals. They do this largely by regulating their enzymes. And there's a, a, a couple different ways in which enzymes are regulated in biological systems. The first one is what we call transcriptional regulation. Now, transcription is the first step in the expression of a gene. So the central dogma of molecular biology states that genetic information is stored as DNA. It's then converted by a process called transcription into RNA, and then that RNA is then translated into a protein. Enzymes are proteins, remember. So transcriptional regulation basically means the, that you're regulating an enzyme by just either making it or not making it. So turning on the gene or not turning on the gene. Because if you turn on the gene, you're going to end up producing the enzyme. If you don't turn on the gene, then there's not going to be any enzyme. So what typically happens in a particular cell is uh, that, that regulates an enzyme this way would be if the substrates are around. So for example, if you're an E. coli cell and you just absorb some lactose as a food source, well, then you turn on the production of the enzymes that are needed. You transcribe the genes that are needed to produce the lactase enzymes. When there's no more lactose around, you turn off the expression of genes that are used to produce the lactase enzymes. You just turn them on and you turn them off. That's what we call transcriptional regulation. Now that works really well in prokaryotes, but eukaryotic systems are a lot more complex. Transcriptional regula regulation is a lot slower and more complex of a process. Another way of regulating enzyme act enzymatic activity is through the use of inhibitors. So inhibitors are typically small molecules that, uh, that interact with an enzyme, and in doing so, reduce the enzymatic rate of activity. They slow down the reaction. Now the advantage to inhibitors is that they work relatively fast and they are reversible. So if you're doing transcriptional regulation and you stop production of a gene, thereby stopping production of the enzymatic protein product, well, then that can take a little bit of time before you turn that gene on and you do transcription and translation. With, with inhibitors, it can be very quick because the inhibitor can either bind or not bind. So before we start talking about how inhibitors work, First, we have to understand how enzymes actually work. Now, you may have learned at one point in your academic career that enzymes work through a lock and key model. The lock and key model does a very good job of describing the unique specificity that enzymes have, the fact that only certain keys can unlock certain locks and so on and so forth. But in actuality, that's not how enzymes work. The correct model for describing how an enzyme actually works is called the induced fit model. And what I want you to understand about the induced fit model and how enzymes work is I want you to start thinking about them uh, instead of a lock and a key, start thinking about them as a baseball glove. So if you look at a baseball glove, the way a baseball glove is going to work is in order for me to catch a ball with this baseball glove, I have to squeeze the glove a little bit because if I just leave it open, the ball is going to hit and then immediately bounce out. Okay. So the way an enzyme actually works is it takes in the substrate or the substrates. It squeezes a little bit. That squeeze, that induced fit is required in order to perform the enzymatic reaction, the conversion of the reactants into the products. And then it relaxes again to allow the products to leave the enzyme. The best way to understand then how enzymes are regulated through inhibitors is to understand this induced fit model. There are three major types of inhibition. The first one is what is called competitive inhibition. Competitive inhibition is the type of inhibition that happens when a molecule called an inhibitor binds specifically to the active site. Now, if we go back to my baseball glove analogy, what is supposed to be caught by a baseball glove? The answer is a baseball. Now, a baseball is not the only thing that I can fit into that glove. Correct? Absolutely. So if I'm in a baseball game and a pitcher throws a small spherical object at me and that small spherical object actually is yellow and fuzzy, did he just throw a baseball at me? No, he probably just threw a tennis ball at me. Will that fit in my glove? Absolutely. It will fit right into the active site of my enzyme. But is it the right substrate? No, it's a tennis ball. 
And if he then subsequently throws me a baseball, am I going to be able to catch it? No, because I have a tennis ball right in the active site of my enzyme, right in the pocket of my glove. Now, what you have to remember then is remember that enzymes perform about 100,000 reactions per second in some cases. That means 100,000 times per second, it's binding to a different substrate. So how then do you end up getting inhibition if the inhibitor isn't even going to stay bound for even a hundred thousandth of a second? It's simple. If you want a lot of inhibition, you need a lot of competitive inhibitors. So what that means basically is that when it comes to limiting the rate of a chemical reaction, what we call Vmax or the maximum velocity of a chemical reaction, the more inhibitor you have, the more inhibition you get. If you want to make sure that the reaction continues to happen at a high rate, you simply increase the amount of substrate relative to the amount of inhibitor. The reason why is they're both competing for binding to the active site of that enzyme. The next type of inhibition is known as non-competitive inhibition. Non-competitive inhibition occurs when the inhibitor binds to not the active site, but another site within the molecule called an allosteric site. So if I'm using my baseball glove analogy again, a competitive inhibitor is going to bind to the pocket of the glove. It's going to bind to the active site. It's going to compete with the substrate for that. An allosteric inhibitor or a non-competitive inhibitor is going to bind here where my hand goes, for example. Now, is the binding pocket open? Is the active site open? Absolutely. But if there's a ball shoved in the back here where my hand goes, am I going to be able to close the glove? Am I going to be able to induce the fit of my enzyme? And the answer is no. So when you have a non-competitive inhibitor, the enzyme substrate complex can still exist. But because the molecule, because the protein can't do its induced fit, can't change its conformation, or does so less efficiently than it normally does, because of the presence of the allosteric or non-competitive inhibitor, well, the end result is a slowed reaction. Unlike with competitive inhibitors, you cannot relieve the inhibition by increasing the amount of substrate. You can't flush it out that way. You can't increase Vmax by out-competing it with more substrate. Why? Because the problem isn't binding to the active site like it is with a competitive inhibitor. The problem is, is the enzyme is now jammed up. It's not able to do what it's supposed to do. The third major type of inhibition is what's called uncompetitive inhibition. This is another one of those examples where I don't get to name the thing because I wouldn't have named it uncompetitive versus non-competitive. But uncompetitive is somewhat similar to non-competitive in a way. The uncompetitive inhibitor only can bind to the enzyme once it's bound to its substrate. So it waits for the baseball to get into the pocket and then it does something to sort of hold the glove shut. So it can't release the products. So non-competitive inhibition is going to bind to the allosteric site. It's going to bind to that site to prevent the induced fit from occurring. An uncompetitive inhibitor is going to wait until the enzyme substrate complex exists and then do something to prevent the products from being released. What we largely believe is that the reason it works this way is because the uncompetitive inhibitor can't bind properly until the enzyme substrate complex exists. And again, you really can't outcompete that by adding more substrate. The main reason why is it's still trapped in there. Okay? So those are the three major types of inhibition. Now, inhibitors are great because they work quite quickly. And you can and, and quite often those inhibitors can actually be the product of the enzymatic reaction itself. This brings us to our, our final type of inhibition that I want to discuss, and this is what is called feedback inhibition. Now, the thing we have to understand about feedback inhibition is this. Feedback inhibition is not mutually exclusive with the other three types. Feedback inhibition does not refer to the mechanism of inhibition. It refers to the source of the inhibitor. So a feedback inhibitor can, uh, can operate through either competitive, non-competitive, or uncompetitive inhibition mechanisms. All feedback inhibition is referring to is that the inhibitor is a product of the enzymatic reaction or enzymatic process itself. Think of it a bit like a thermostat. When your house is too cold in the winter 
and the thermostat detects that your house has dropped below whatever temperature you set it at. Let's say 72 degrees Fahrenheit. If your temperature of your house drops below 72 degrees Fahrenheit, the thermostat goes into action. It triggers your furnace to kick on. Your furnace works until it gets your house to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, the thermostat goes, oh, we're good and kicks off. It feeds back to itself. Its own action causes it to turn off. And then when the house gets cold again, the thermostat will kick back on, turn your furnace back on and repeat the process. That is the way many of the metabolic processes in your cell are regulated. They're actually regulated by their own products. In another video, we'll talk specifically about an enzymatic process called glycolysis. Glycolysis is an enzymatic process that's used to break down carbohydrates to produce energy. And one of the products of glycolysis is ATP. Now, the problem with ATP is this. Your cells need it, but they can't stockpile it. ATP doesn't hang out very well. It doesn't store very well. And if you build up too much of it, a lot of it will actually just degrade back into ADP or AMP and become useless again. And then you just have to put in more energy to do more phosphorylation. So in short, your body doesn't want to build up too much ATP. So how does ATP feed back to regulate glycolysis? Well, glycolysis involves 10 enzymatic steps in order to reach its end product. One of those end products being ATP. Well, it turns out that ATP actually acts as a feedback inhibitor to allosterically or non-competitively inhibit the final enzyme in the glycolytic process called pyruvate kinase. It gets right in the way, prevents pyruvate kinase from working. So in a sense, the faster pyruvate kinase works, the more ATP gets built up. As more ATP gets built up, the slower pyruvate kinase is going to work because the more inhibited it will be. Eventually, as that ATP is consumed by other cellular processes, there'll be less ATP around, there'll be less inhibition on pruvate kinase, and all of a sudden, pruvate kinase is back working at full capacity. Feedback inhibition is a wonderful way in which biological systems regulate the enzymatic processes and the chemical reactions that are occurring. In a sense, it allows most enzymatic processes to self-regulate. If they're being too successful, they actually end up shutting themselves off. Then when their, when their enzymatic product is low in the cell, they kick back on because there's no more inhibitor around. It's a really neat system. And it's another wonderful example of evolutionary efficiency. One of the things that we talk about in biology all the time is that evolution doesn't make perfect organisms, but it's pretty good at making sure that cells are incredibly efficient at what they do. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video today on metabolism. Uh, just to, to review, we went over the different types of chemical reactions, exergonic, which release energy, endergonic, which consume energy. We talked about enzymes, which are protein catalysts, and how their specificity with respect to substrates, as well as their ability to uh, greatly increase the rate of chemical reactions is essential for all living things. And the fact that those enzymes are highly regulated, either transcriptionally or through the activity of inhibitors. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found this, this video informative and helpful, and I will talk to you guys real soon. Thanks.